We're doing a series right now through Acts, uh, which has been really good. We're getting ready for the church to, to move locations, and it was a reminder to us that the church is definitely not a building, and it's certainly not an event. Um, and so we thought it'd be good to kind of root ourselves in what does it mean to be church, and Acts is the place to go if you're going to look for that. And um, last week, we, we looked at Peter and Cornelius um, in Acts 9, and um, and then John told me before he left that next week he needs to preach Acts 12, which is kind of the next stopping spot. So I was kind of stuck this week reading through it and going, man, this is not something I've ever preached before. And um, But I was I was um, incredibly refreshed when I stumbled across Acts 11, 19 uh, through 26. And that's what we're going to be looking at. And it's, it's the story of the Church of Antioch. And last week, as we looked at Peter and Cornelius, we talked about, does our love um, for God and for others, does it stretch far enough? Um, and uh, Acts eleven nineteen describes a church where that love does. Um, what does it look like when a church's love stretches past its, its normal walls? And, um, and I want to start with just a question, which is, um, what makes a great church? And I'm curious what you have to say. So what do you think? Jesus. Jesus. Okay, let's have Jesus in it. That's probably an important <laughs> ingredient for a great church. What do you think? Yep. What makes a great church? People loving each other. Mm. Okay, community cares for each other, for sure. Absolutely. Belonging? Sense of belonging, mm -hmm. yeah. Coming together before the Lord and worshiping, yeah. We can throw that one in. Support system. A support system? Being available to God, absolutely, and asking God what He wants us to do. It's important. Being real with each other. And being real, absolutely. Being real with each other. Good stuff. All right, you guys are on the right track. We're going to add some more stuff today. It's going to be good. Um, we are going to look at the church at Antioch, and um, I am going to read for us. Uh, Acts 11, 19 through 26, and we'll get a, a picture of this church. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. And then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. And the disciples were called Christians, first at Antioch. <coughs> All right, so let's pray. God, um, thanks for this first church of Christians. Pray that you would open it up for us so that we could see our lives and our church and our community in it. Um, speak to us about what you would have us do. Like mm -hmm. David Cheesher suggested, we're available to you. We love you, Lord. Amen. All right, let me tell you something about um, Antioch. First of all, it's, it's the very first Christian church. Before that, it was Jewish folks who would come to believe in, in Jesus. And uh, now all of a sudden, you have Greeks coming, and they came straight to Jesus, and they began to be called Christians, little Christs. That's what that means. Um, it was a rough town that they went to. Uh, Antioch was second only to Corinth in the ancient world of Kind of like Sin City. So in, in our culture, if you go, man, Vegas is the place where people are running straight away against the Lord. Um, that would be Corinth. And uh, New York City would probably be the equivalent of uh, Antioch. It's just not a place of great faith. Um, and these Christians were beginning to spread out because they were being persecuted. So this was a rough time to be a Christian. 
Um, and one of the most incredible things to me is that they weren't intimidated at all. They showed up and said everywhere they went, they shared the good news of what Jesus was doing in their lives. And they shared it with Jewish people, and then these folks who had made it all the way out to uh, Antioch and weren't originally Jewish folks in the first place, they began to share with their neighbors, and they didn't know the rules that you weren't supposed to share with people who weren't Jewish yet, and so they just shared, and people came to the Lord. Um, and so God began to just move in the blessing and, and bless people as they did this. Um, at the heart of it was just a bunch of people who the Lord had done something in their lives, and then they went and shared it with the people around them. That's, that's how the Christian church has been moving for the last 2016 years or whatnot. Um, they shared their experience. And God showed up as they shared, and there was a divine movement. And I think that's true today, that God still blesses us as we kind of reach out and share our stories. Um, Christina and I had the luxury of having my niece come live with us for a month this summer. And we got a chance to kind of talk with her about faith, and she said she wasn't ready to engage it. She was going to engage it after her senior year, when she had more time, and, and she left, and I was so discouraged. And then I got a text uh, just this week that said, Hey, Uncle Buzz, which is my nickname, by the way. Uncle Buzz, could you do me a favor? And I said, well, you can ask any favor you want. I may or may not do it, but yes, ask away. And, um, and she said, can you pray for me? I just applied for a job at Hollister. She wants to go work at Hollister. And I thought, this isn't like a crisis prayer. This is just a, I want to pray about something that I want, and I want to see God do. And I'm going, she's on the road. Um, just because she happened to hang out in our house, and, and people shared with her. And this has been going on forever. The Christian church doesn't usually look like just finding the people who would be churchgoers. Um, People end up sharing, and there's a skate church in Seattle right now that you never know where they're going to meet because they send out a text message about where they're going to be skating that day. And they go and they skateboard, and then they have a little message on skate church. You can look it up. It's fantastic. And there are rock musicians out there who are sharing their faith with other rock musicians, and, and they're jamming together. And ministry is where God has places. Wherever you spend your time, between now and the next time we have service, God's at work with the people that are there and ministries available to be there. Um, and so, Christians, when we love God, we keep inviting. It's not rude, it's not pushy, don't shove it down anyone's throat. Um, but it's, like Scott said, just being real. And not just being real with each other who have the faith, but being real with people who don't. I remember at one point, uh, I was struggling with um, the well with our church plant that we had done a number of years ago, and I was, I was saying, man, it doesn't feel like we're growing, and I blamed it on the fact that we didn't have the right character of people there. We didn't have a social butterfly of a person who like knew 100 people and had a tendency to bring like 50 people with them and a different person every day to church. And, um, and so I was meeting with this church planning consultant, and I said, you know, we don't, we don't have like the social butterfly and we're not like the cool 20 something church of really cool people where just everybody wants to be with them because they're the cool people and I said we're kind of a tight community of, of odd people and um, and his answer to me was well it sounds like you should be getting more odd people because that's who your people love and it, and it occurred to me that um, our job is not to control the results but when we're real with each other, when we're real with other people about our faith, one of the natural reactions is the love of God gets shared. And the early church was in a context that was similar to ours, not a place of great faith. Um, and yet, they reached out with the love of God. And I felt incredibly challenged by this because Seattle, I, I often think people don't want to hear what I have to say about Jesus. And I don't want to be a pushy person, and I don't want to be super religious, and I, I can't afford to lose friends, so I'll just hold back. Um, and one of the things that occurred to me this week is that everybody likes to be invited to things, whatever it is. They can say no. Um, I was out golfing with my mom's wife, and uh, we have this great 
relationship where we were hanging out, and she said, hey, do you want to come over for dinner on Sunday night? And I said, well, I actually have a small group that I go to, and, and she goes, oh, what's that? And I was telling her about it, and I said, actually, I'm starting one up on Thursday. It's going to be right across the street from your house. Do you want to come? And she goes, well, I'm not much for, for Bible study. And I go, oh, we don't do a lot of, like, studying. I don't think we're going to, like, sit down and bring out pads of paper and start taking deep notes. What we do is we just look at something that might apply to our lives, and then we talk about it. And she goes, well, well, think about it. So my small group would get very interesting, um, which is awesome. But I think that's what it was. It was just a natural outflow of, oh, what are you doing that night? How was your weekend? Did you ever get asked that question? Well, that was awesome because I was sitting there listening to a pedal steel on Sunday morning, and it's so good. So, um, and I think there's a key starting spot uh, for this. I know this is a little disjointed. I'm a little ill right now, so things are not uh, nice and in order. But a key starting spot for this is just praying for those people. Praying for those people who we go, man, it'd be really cool if they met the Lord, and I think it would really help them out. And so, um, I have a actual tangible challenge for you. Doherty, can you be my assistant? You bet. My lovely assistant, Dave Doherty. Um, pass those out, one to everybody. I want you to put a name on it um, of somebody who you think could use knowing the Lord. And then on your way out, there's a, a another non-matching wooden object uh, right at the, the back of bowl. And you can put it in there. And I think during the prayer times in the future, we're going to just pull a name out and we're going to pray for that person as a part of our prayer time. Because we need to be praying for those folks who don't know Jesus yet. So, um, so that's what we're going to do. Um, now, uh, back at the Mothership Church in Jerusalem, they were going, wait, so, so Greeks are now coming to the Lord. They, we didn't expect this to happen. And they, they took their trusted young uh, Barnabas and they, they had him come check it out. It's verse 22 that, that he does that. He comes checks it out. And when he arrived, he saw what the grace of God had done and he was delighted over it. Um, and that seems like a natural response. Oh, look, God's moving. This is really, really cool. Um, and he worshipped with them and he hung out with them and he hung out with them for a year. And I just want to like mess with this just a little bit around the fact that this was not a comfortable environment for Barnabas to be in. It was a little uncomfortable. Here he was in the second worst town in all the ancient world and all these people are just coming to the Lord and they've got their baggage and they've got their stories and they're not all put together right and, um, and they're Greeks. This is the first time he'd ever worshipped with a bunch of Greek people and they're doing some Jewish worship stuff and they're, they're focused on Jesus, and that's what really what mattered at the end of the day. Um, but here he was, and one of the beautiful things about his faith was he had this openness about it that said, I just want to see God move. I see God move in people's lives. And so he was delighted as he saw Greeks come to the Lord, and he was eating with them, and, and he didn't have this box about what does it look like to be a Christian. And I think it's a, a, a challenge for us to say, can we be a church that doesn't have a box around people and goes, now that person could be a Christian uh, if they knew the Lord. By the way, that was um, one of my first evangelism um, faux pas I'd probably say that I ever did was I was working at McDonald's. A buddy of mine by the name of Chris also, because there's a few of us in the world. Um, <laughs> He didn't know the Lord, and I thought, and I was talking to him, and he said something, and it just, like, popped out of my mouth, and I go, man, you're like a Christian who doesn't know Jesus yet. And, uh, and I had been telling him that he should uh, check out the book of John and read it, because that had been powerful in my life. And um, so he went home, and he read the book of John, and, and he came to the Lord, and it was the most beautiful thing to watch, because his countenance lightened. And all of a sudden, it seemed like he didn't have all these burdens, and he began to get kind and nice, and that wasn't how I would have described him before. And uh, he was living with this longtime girlfriend, and they decided to get married, and he found this fantastic church to be a part of. Anyways, his, his life was just transformed. And later on, we were talking, and I totally didn't know this about him, but he was like an anti-Christian. He was trying to decide whether or not he should beat me up for being a Christian when we were talking at McDonald's. And um, 
and maybe God just spared me, but, um, and then he read the book of John because he wanted to prove to me that he was not a Christian who just didn't know Jesus yet, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but God moved. Um, it's certainly not our brilliance, our abilities, our programs, any of that. Um, God blessed this Antioch church, and so he moved as they shared their faith. Um, it's a powerful thing to watch. It's probably one of the most rewarding things we can have. Um, and then uh, one of the first things that Barnabas does after he gets delighted and sees this is he goes and finds his friend Saul. And says, Saul, this is awesome. you got to come see this. And he brings him along, and they hung out for a year together in this community. And it reminded me that um, being a Christian alone doesn't work at all, period. Um, the early church, the community of faith is so important and I love the fact it was one of the first things that struck me about Harbor Church is people when we do our prayer times, they share about all sorts of stuff. It's not just somebody has cancer, we should pray for them. And people talk about, hey I applied for a new job, I could use a new job uh, I'm excited about this, praise God and it's us sharing our lives together and um, Christians who share their lives together do really, really well. They grow, and they continue to grow. And Dave Doherty and I were talking about this this morning. Christians who try to go it alone, even they, though they might be the most disciplined Bible readers or the best prayers or whatnot, they just don't thrive well. Um, the community of church did ministry together. They found friends. And um, I think one of the best things for us as we go about sharing our faith is in our neighborhood. Find out if there's another Christian as you talk to people. Find out if there's another Christian at your work and, and begin to pray for your people at work. Or uh, There's always a togetherness involved. Um, Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10 says, um, two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. We work better together. And what are the one who falls uh, when there's not somebody else there to pick them up? And when we have our hard days, Having somebody else there who shared your faith and will pray for you and encourage you is incredible. It's that support system that we talk about in a great church. Jesus, when he sent out the 72 to go share the good news as he was um, walking with these disciples, he sent them out. He said, I'm going to give you power. I'm going to bless your efforts. Um, but go out by choose. Because you're not supposed to do it alone. You ever go to a movie alone? Side note, I've done it. It's not very fun. Like, it, it, to me, it was kind of like a depressing adventure. And I sat like in the front row because I didn't want to be around anybody. And I went to this movie, you know. All right. And then as I'm leaving, whether the movie was good or terrible, I didn't have anybody to talk to about it. Um, going to a movie with somebody, all kinds of energy begins to bubble up and different conversations happen. And it's the same as we go about our faith. Doing faith with other people is a big deal. Um, it changes things. And so, two of those things that are a, a big deal, um, if we're going to be a church that looks like Antioch, is one, we share our faith with other people. Naturally, authentically, people who don't know church. And then the other one is um, doing ministry together. We invite each other into things, and we do stuff together. Uh, all right, one more section in this 27 through 30. I'm going to read it. Um, it says that during that time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that there was going to be a severe famine that would spread over the entire Roman world. And this happened during the reign of Claudius. And the disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. This they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. So these folks are often another part of the Roman world, and they um, sent some money back with Saul and Barnabas back to Jerusalem as a gift because there was going to be a famine. And it said that there was uh, a prophet who visited, and a prophecy is just somebody who speaks the word of God. That's what it is. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean predicting the future. Sometimes it does. But basically, the Lord wanted to say something to this community, and what the Lord had to say is, there's about to be a famine, and it's going to spread over the entire Roman world, um, which is the whole world at the time. There was no non-Roman part of the world at this point. Um, 
And so, this word came forth. And uh, I don't know, my tendency sometimes when I hear, like, God did something really cool, or we share something on a Wednesday, and I'm like, that was a God thing. There's a part of me that hears it and enjoys it and goes, wow, that's, that's significant. And I kind of process it, and maybe I share it with somebody else. Hey, this happened this morning, and it's pretty cool. Um, but then I don't do anything with it. And they did something with it. They heard it, and then they responded. And I'm going to start measuring the sightings of God that I see in my life in these little moments uh, with action steps. What did they encourage me to do? Um, there was an action thing for it. And the other important thing about this is the famine spread over the entire known world. Now, um, Josephus, an uh, ancient church historian, noted that it, it especially hit hard in Judea. Uh, it was the Middle East, there's not a lot of food, and there's records of people dying of starvation because they could not afford food because the price of food just skyrocketed. So this is basically the stock market crash, housing bubble bursting, and a natural disaster all rolled into one. And, uh, and people are on the edge. And the disciples' response, um, upon hearing this word that there's going to be this famine, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder if we'd go, maybe I should keep my money. I better, I better create a savings account. I better shore up my reserves. We better stockpile some food in the, in the church refrigerator so that we're taken care of. And I love that their response is, where is this family going to reach? It's going to get hard in Jerusalem. We better, we better send some stuff there because stuff travels slow in the ancient world. And if we wait until we hear a cry for help from them, be too late. There was a need around them, and they met it with action, and they were concerned about other people. Um, they used this resource, this word given to them, this prophecy, and they took it to heart, and they did something about it. And their knee-jerk response was to care and to meet the needs around them. Um, this church is good at that, by the way. Um, we respond to needs. When a need comes up, uh, we, we step up. I know that um, we recently had set up a, a food train for Jane because she was coming out of uh, being in the hospital. And, and so we thought it'd be nice if some folks cooked her meals. And that calendar filled up awfully quick. And my guess is Jane's freezer is awfully full <laughs> of some really, really good food. Um, but here's the question that I'm challenged by this passage with. What if we set up food trains for people that weren't a part of this church? People that we knew from our work that could use a little help. What would that look like? What if, what if we knew of somebody who had, a, had an accident could use some yard care? A bunch of guys from the church could go over there. Uh, the beauty of what they did was they didn't keep it for themselves. Um, it's a powerful, powerful thing. And then in verse 29 it said... Um, as the Lord had blessed them, let's see, it says, uh, the disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help. Um, it's literally, as God had blessed them, as any one of them had been prospered by the Lord, they gave. Um, and I think this points to the fact that it's not just a money issue. What has God blessed you with? Time? Some extra time around your calendar, some, some extra money house to invite people to, some gifts or ability like our musicians today. God bless them with the ability to play instruments and lead us into his worship. So they're giving that gift. Um, when God blesses us, he never blesses us just for our sake. He blesses us so that it can flow through us. And then we have a story to share as well as a blessing to pass on. Um, and when the community of faith comes together to do stuff, uh, and to bless people, incredible things happen. Um, I think I've shared this story before, but I'm going to share it again because it's, it's just awesome. Uh, I was at a small group in, at, at ASU, and um, there was this guy who called and said, I, I can't make a small group, my bike got stolen. And um, we looked around the room, and somebody goes, well, I think I have an old bike frame in my garage. And another guy goes, oh, I totally know how to work on bikes. And I was working with computers, so I happen to have some money. So I go, oh, what parts do you need? And I drove down to the bike shop and got them. And then somebody else went to go drive out and get this guy to pick him up and bring him to small group. And by the time that he got to small group, 
we had thrown a bike together for him. Um, and it didn't cost any of us very much. But as the Lord had blessed us, we passed it forward. Um, that's the Christian church. Um, and we live in a culture where churches like Antioch are not the norm. Um, the church is so good at becoming an insider's club that stops inviting and assumes that the world doesn't want what we have to offer. And um, people are trying to follow Christ as best they can, but they're doing it as solo adventures. Um, and uh, it takes a community to impact faith. And the church isn't known for um, always reaching out and meeting tangible needs. It's known for a, a intangible spirituality. And churches that get known for an intangible spirituality um, become irrelevant very, very quickly. Our faith has to hit the ground. The beautiful thing is we have all the ingredients here for our church to be more like Antioch than that cultural norm that I just described. Um, our church can be a place that invites. Our church can be a place where people come together and have real, honest, authentic community. And our church um, can, re can meet needs of others um, outside of our door. We have a small enough group that we are agile enough that if somebody popped up and said, hey, I know somebody at work that can use this, my guess is they'd get that. Um, so, the challenge is, can we step out in instructions together? Can we do it? And I know that I prayerfully and fearfully, with hope in God, will do our best to lead us in that direction. Sound good? Mm -hmm. All right, let's pray. God, we um, appreciate the way that you blessed us. We, we thank you for this community and the way that it ministers to our souls and our lives and our bodies and the way that we care for one another. God, this is a great church, um, without any doubt. And Lord, uh, I feel challenged that we can be even better. And so, help us to be your hands and feet to the world. Help us to be people who invite and share. Help us to be people who walk with each other with, with deeper honesty and vulnerability um, than maybe we're even comfortable with sometimes. God, uh, be with us. Most of all, bless us as you bless Antioch. Uh, bless us in our sharing and in our doing and our sharing your love this week in whatever it is we're about. We love you.